Good morning and welcome to the United Methodist Church of the Dunes. I'm Pastor Lou and we are delighted to have you as a part of our online worship experience today. As we begin our time today, we do have a few announcements to share with you. We continue, of course, to celebrate the resurrection of Christ as we celebrate through Easter. Many thanks to all of our ushers, volunteers, office staff, musicians, donors, organizers that made it possible to have such a wonderful time of worship on Easter Sunday morning. Also at the church this week, uh, two new spring Bible studies will begin. We have volunteers that have begun regularly sewing quilt squares to be made into blankets for refugee children. Activities like the chair yoga classes and caregiver support group continue to meet. We hope that if you have a way to get involved in one of these groups, you will do so. Also, plans are underway for a bicycle blessing at the end of May, so please be looking for more information about that. Also, on Sunday morning, we will be receiving new members into our congregation, and we do that, of course, with great joy. Next Sunday is Communion Sunday, so if you're an online participant uh, every Sunday, we hope that you will make sure that you have some juice and bread next Sunday morning or whenever you worship uh, with us around that May 1st date and uh, you'll have an opportunity uh, to share in communion. Thank you for being here today. Welcome to worship. Please join me now in our call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise God in the vault of heaven. Praise God in the earth and skies. Sing praises to the Lord. Shout and sing praises to God. We have witnessed God's mighty acts. We have seen the Lord's greatness. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Let everything that draws breath praise the Lord. Will you sing with me our first hymn? and girls it's time for our children's time we hope that you are having a good week and I wanted to think about with you whether or not today might still be Easter some of you may be saying no Pastor Lou it's not Easter that was on April 17th but in the church Easter isn't a day that just happens and then it's over it's a day we keep on celebrating it's a day to remind us of the resurrection of Christ but also 
the new hope and new life that we have in Jesus. And that's something we can celebrate every day. In fact, we celebrate it all of this month and all of next month. So we hope you will continue to celebrate with us the new life that you find in Jesus. And say Happy Easter, even though many people will think, hmm, I thought it was already over. Will you pray with me, please? Dear God, bless these children. Help them to have a wonderful week. And to remember that for Christians, every day reminds us of the new birth that you bring us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Must we see you in order to believe you, Lord? Is seeing truly believing? Are we to be prisoners of our senses, distrusting and rejecting whatever we cannot see, touch, or hear? Yet you are faithful. You give sight to the blind. You carry us when we are weary. You call us to your side. The locked rooms of our hearts open at the turn of your key. Speak your words of life to us again. Do not doubt, only believe. Speak your words of life that we might live. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. The peace of God be with you. Receive God's forgiveness and the promise of the Spirit. For Jesus is risen from the dead. Seen or unseen, he is present in our midst. And we see the presence of Christ reflected in each other's faces. Happy are those who have not seen yet have come to believe. Amen. At this time, we encourage you to send your offering to the United Methodist Church of the Dunes to further our ministry and to share the love of Christ with others. You can go to our online giving tab that you'll find on our website or send your gifts to 717 and that's on Sheldon Road in Grand Haven, Michigan, 49417. Thank you for giving and continuing to support the ministry of our church. Greetings, everyone, from uh, Majors Bill and Heather Holman here at the Grand Haven Salvation Army. We thank you so much for your ongoing support to us. Um, because what that means is we're able to minister to those in need in our community right here in North Ottawa County. There are several ways in which we ministered and which Bill's going to share with you just now. It's been a difficult year get, working through all the details of this pandemic, and but we've been uh, very successful in still meeting the needs of those that we uh, help uh, in this community. Uh, we've been able to help people with, through our food pantry and uh, people coming to get assistance uh, either through rent and mortgage or through assistance with their utilities. 
Uh, we've also helped uh, people with their uh, documents, like getting birth certificates and things like that. Uh, we've also helped uh, people get around trans transportation with transportation um, tokens uh, to get around through the city uh, to meet their needs with uh, jobs and and going back to work. Uh, we've also helped people who have uh, been struggling with uh, shelter. And so um, we continue to uh, be blessed in this community. Um, one other thing that we help with uh, during the year is uh, we help with backpacks uh, of kids going back to school and uh, providing for them uh, school supplies uh, that has helped them uh, to start their education or continue on with their education and be better students in school. One of the things you might not be aware of is that we have six uh, homeless shelter units that we run um, on a, a daily basis and, and there are families that come in, they have to have minor children with them and as they come to us they can be in our emergency shelter program which is up to 90 days and then um, transition possibly into our transitional um, program, which is can be up to two years. This is a time where we're able to work one-on-one -on -one with the families. They come in, they set their goals, we help them fulfill those goals, and we just work as a whole person with them to try to stop the homelessness, to stop the poverty that they might be uh, generationally facing. Um, not all of them are in that situation. Some of them just come because they've just run into some bad times. And, um, you know, the, the, the hole just keeps getting di uh, deeper and deeper and they're not able to get out of it. So we feel very blessed um, by your donations that we're able to help these folks and work alongside them. We've recently had a family that was with us for over two years and they were able to uh, save their money mm -hmm. and purchase a home right here in Grand Haven and keep their children in school. And that was such a blessing. And so, um, again, those that comes because of generous donations from folks like you. And we are just so blessed by that. We work with other families uh, that are not staying in our, our homeless shelters uh, through our Pathway of Hope program. And again, it's that goal setting program where they come in and they meet with our caseworker. Uh, they can meet with us and have some pastoral counseling as well. And uh, we work with them on their goals. We've had someone that has completed their college education and been able to get a license and a, and a certificate to be able to move on and get a better job. So uh, there's just, um, there's endless ways in which we're able to help people, but there are not endless ways that we financially can do that. But with your donations and with your generosity of your hard earned money and your faith in us at the Salvation Army, we say thank you because um, 87 to 93 uh, percent of every dollar that goes that comes into our facility goes right back out into um, services and programs that uh, meet the needs of the community in which we live. So again, we just want to say thank you. Um, we appreciate you so much, and we appreciate the fact that uh, we serve a God that is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and every day. And what a blessing that is. Thank you again for your generosity. Amen.
Will you pray with me our prayer of dedication? O God of our salvation, we are witnesses to your amazing deeds. By the resurrection of your Son, Jesus, you have opened the gate to eternal life. We are grateful for your gifts of forgiveness and a new start. Let the obedience of Christ, the righteous one, become the chief cornerstone of our lives. Help us to use our spiritual gifts and monetary blessings to be a testimony to your glory. We dedicate ourselves and our offerings through Christ our risen Lord. Amen. from the New Testament book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please listen for the reading of the Gospel, John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked, for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins, of any, they are forgiven them. 
If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the marks of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. May God bless this reading from the Holy Gospel. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the magic of this moment that Somehow in the mystery of resurrection, we find out more who you are and that you trust us and that you forgive us and offer us life despite ourselves. Give us life as we listen for this sermon so that when we leave here, we might be renewed and strengthened by your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Easter's over, right? The celebration of resurrection was last week. The trumpets have sounded. The tubas sounded the the drums have been hit the bells have been rung the choirs have sung the congregation has sung but there's no accident that we celebrate easter not just once in a while but we celebrate it each first day of the week every sunday is a little resurrection because Resurrection Day, Easter, was the greatest day of all eternity. It is a day when we're reminded of the powerful, spirit-filled new life that is made possible because of Jesus' triumph over death. It becomes a weekly event, not just to tie up the end of our week, but to begin each week to know that we are full of new life, in our story today, Jesus Christ appears and offers to his disciples his presence. There were many sightings. There were sightings everywhere. But on that Easter day, there's a strange gap in his schedule between the time he spoke to Mary Magdalene at the tomb and when he finally decides to check up on his disciples. Commentator John Stendhal invites us to imagine the sights and the sounds and the feelings and the moments of that post-resurrection experience. What would you imagine that Jesus' first words might be to the defeated, spineless disciples who ran off and betrayed him, allowing him to walk alone, to Pilate, to Jesus' accusers, allowed him to walk all the way to Calvary where he was stripped and whipped and executed? What might those disciples expect to hear? Let's... Let's transport ourselves back. It's the evening of Resurrection Day. Ten of the eleven disciples are cowering nervously in a small room. Their palms sweat as they experience a broad range of conflicting emotions. Not only had they lost a friend, now they were leaderless. They were without hope, without vision, without purpose. They were hearing messages and reports about the tomb being empty. But honestly, with the facts that they had seen, with Jesus dead, they presumed all was lost, that hope for them was gone. Like a dog after a, ball, they had, a brawl, they had crawled to a safe corner to lick their wounds. This may be a place that you have traveled a time or two. I certainly have in my life. A place where my dreams have been dashed and hope is playing hide-and-seek with my soul and I'm unsure. 
Have you been there? That day, rumors were flying that someone had seen the risen Lord, but the stories traveled around more like wishful thinking than confirmed breaking news. A couple of disciples had re even run up to the tomb to check it out for themselves, finding there empty as they had been told, no one home. Surely if Jesus had been risen, he would have visited all of them first. There's, there's no hard evidence here that Jesus was really risen, only witnesses to an empty tomb. And some of the witnesses were non-legal witnesses, women. They were the first ones to announce the resurrection, but they were not a trusted source in this religious community, not even qualified as legal witnesses. The Me Too movement would take several more years to develop, and by several more years, I mean over two millennia. So the leftover disciples locked themselves up. In fear, it says, of the Jews, but I'm thinking in fear of lots of things, the Jews, the Romans, and well, maybe even Jesus. Someone might recognize they were followers of Jesus. They certainly were looking for them. All the other people who had helped Jesus, rounding them up. They knew they were next on the list for elimination and that they would be on that list because they might have been seen with Jesus. The authorities were afraid of riots and other things. And so our scriptures draw a, a picture of cowering disciples in an upper room completely in fear. But why? Well, I can think of a couple of reasons. One, if Jesus was dead, they had lost everything. Their hope was gone. Their leader was gone. Their teacher was gone. And now the authorities would likely drag them away. And two, which may be even a scarier possibility to them, was Jesus was alive. They would have to answer for their recent unfaithfulness they would have to allow, they'd have to come up with some explanation to Jesus why they had walked away, why they had betrayed him. They would have to deal with the consequences of their doubt and unfaithfulness. And so they locked themselves in a room, maybe each disciple feeling a little bit different part of these fears. But when you lock yourself in a room, well, let's just say when you lock yourself up in fear, you all also lock others out. So there's a way in which it is impossible for you to move forward. In fact, the disciples were probably hoping that they were safe there, that they didn't want to deal with what was going on inside them. The problem is that when they succumb to their fears and lock themselves up with all their deep feelings and fears, it paralyzed their ability to minister. The very thing they were mourning, the loss of a leader and direction and action, happened because they allowed fear to seize them. The whole movement was instantly stalled. They were closed in and they were closed off from the world. This is exactly the opposite of incarnation. When God sent Jesus into the world, it was so Jesus might be there in the highways and byways and alleyways of our life. Jesus came to engage the world, to show love, to invite people to follow and be close with him, to eat together, to sleep in the same homes, to work side by side. Disciples aren't meant to dwell in safe houses, though we call the place we worship sanctuary, as if to infer that we need to get away. When we choose to lock ourselves away from others, Jesus interrupts our fears. That's what he did that day, that Easter evening. He just showed up. I want to suggest that maybe resurrection is really an incarnation remix. When Jesus is suddenly there, we're told he didn't even knock, maybe he even came through the walls, there's no evidence that hopeful, fervent prayer had been happening, that the disciples had begging God to send Jesus back. Although there might have been. Secretly in their hearts, the disciples, as I said before, might have been a little afraid that Jesus was coming back, despite the fact that Jesus had promised to do just that. 
So I think they were relieved when Jesus came in. They were looking as they looked at Jesus for Jesus's affect. They were pleased to see Jesus had a peaceful smile on his face. His words, his first words came from a deep place of knowing. He said, peace be with you. He knows instantly how the disciples are feeling, what they're thinking. He understands the lonely pain that they, they had experienced and the grief of losing him. But Jesus doesn't wait for contrition, even for the sinfulness that they participated in by betraying Jesus. Jesus simply announces forgiveness. Peace, he said. Peace be with you. One commentator invites us to examine John chapter 20, verse 22, with what he calls an incarnational imagination. He suggests we should ask some questions. What did that breath, what did Jesus' breath smell like? Did it have on it the scent of springtime, he says? Was there something in heaven beyond normal experience? Or was there still the smell of wine and food that he had shared with his disciples three days earlier around a table? Or did they simply smell the common breath of that time, hints of fish and olive oil and fresh bread? Or was it the vinegary gall of the drink that the soldier had offered on the cross? Or the heavy odor of burial spices Was there something of the grave before them? As his wounds were still visible, even as he stood there alive, there was evidence at once of betrayal and victory. All point to the need for reconciliation and yes, peace in and among us. Jesus said, peace be with you. His way of saying, I forgive you. That's just like God, right? Just like God. God didn't wait for all of us to be cleaned up and sorted out and sin free, pressed beautifully in order to come into the world in Jesus. God sent Jesus into the world straight away and set the relationship right. Why? Because that's how God works. And so that's what Jesus did that day, that day of resurrection. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. He forgives them and then he sends them. He commissions them. He gives them a job. He doesn't just offer them peace. He trusts them. He says, I trust you to do the work I've been doing. I give you my peace despite everything you've done, the mistakes you've made, the way you threw away my ministry. Still, I trust you and I love you. When people are invited to join our church as they are being this Sunday morning in our congregation, we are invited them into a reconciled community. And by what I mean that, it is an active process that sins happen and forgiveness is offered between us as the people of God. When people join this church, we, we're inviting them into formed relationships and forming relationships of love and forgiveness and kind of tacitly saying, we will not give up on you and inviting the new person to not give up on us because we will make mistakes. Peace with you, Jesus says. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you, receive the Holy Spirit. Many have said that this passage looks like a tiny Pentecost story that follows immediately after the resurrection. I would argue that this story is more of an incarnational story, that the resurrected Jesus then breathes life into the next generation of disciples, much like God breathed life into Adam and Eve at the beginning of time, into humanity as it was formed. This is notification that the Spirit of God, Christ's Spirit, is still alive and well and is evidenced in Christ's rising and will continue to be evidenced in our lives. 
And then Jesus goes on to describe the commission. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. Don't forget that. But also don't forget this is the exact thing that Jesus was crucified for. It was one of the charges that was set, probably the primary charge that was put before Jesus. Usurping the authority of God because only God can forgive sins. So the first act he makes after he meets his disciples in that room and forgives their sins is to, to go that next step and say he empowers them to do the same, to violate again and again the sensibilities of the scribes and the Pharisees. With that simple word, peace be with you, he invites his disciples to receive peace and the reconciliation that he offers. New life starts with a reconciled life. The only way you can't be forgiven is if you hold on to the sin. Listen to that. The only way that God won't forgive you or can't forgive you is if you retain the sin. How many times do you offer confession only to leave your sin attached? Like a clump of dog hair that you keep trying to get off and keeps statically clinging to you. You try to throw it away, but it keeps clinging. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Let it go. Release the sin. Allow Christ to be incarnate in you. So shall we keep the door locked? The door of our heart, the door of our mind, afraid to approach the world because we've made mistakes, denying the power of the Savior because of what we've done, the sins we've committed, the people we've hurt. With the confidence of Christ and the vulnerability of exposing our past sin, though it's been forgiven and exposed, we are invited to open the doors of our life. It is the only way you can be in real ministry, to allow Christ to be incarnate in you. Let's allow and receive the words that Christ offers. Peace be with you. We are called to this every day, but especially on these resurrection days, every Sunday morning. If we really believe that every Sunday is resurrection day, let's come and praise God together each week, confess our sins, receive forgiveness, and ready ourselves to accept the commission that Christ puts on our life. It's a simple and complicated commission to receive and offer peace. It is the ministry of reconciliation. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for these moments together. We're glad that resurrection doesn't end after a day, but that it is revived in our hearts each and every day as your Holy Spirit is breathed on us. We pray for this church. May we continue in ministry, not because we need to survive, but because other people's lives depend on it. May we worship you in ways that honor who you are. May we serve you in ways that show others who you are. May we be alert to the needs of our community and neighborhoods, as well as our wider world. Convict us where we fall short. Change us where we need to be and bring new life into us daily. Help us to begin again when we need to, to start over, to put and allow you to put our lives right. We pray for reconciliation and peace, that there might be a reconciling force between family members, between church members, and between different groups in society. For, Lord, nothing shows better who you are than the unity and the bond of peace. And now we pray, O oh Lord, that you might pour out your Holy Spirit on us, engaging us, inviting us, blessing us as we search and try to follow you. And now we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Will you sing our last hymn with me? He lives. the grace, love, and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ to be those who have received reconciliation and peace with God and be those who offer such reconciliation and peace to others we know. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. And we thank you for joining us at United Methodist Church of the Dunes. <laughs>